Good morning and welcome to Broad Street Radio and to our regular Sunday topic, Gospel Hour, Power to Get World, as we have always brought to you every Sunday from the stables of Broad Street Radio. I want us to pray first because we have a topic that surely will interest you. And I, if I were you, I will bring my family together, bring my friends, call my friends to join us to discuss this very important topic. Because it doesn't always happen. It's not a topic that is very common or hard in your airwaves as often as it ought to. But let us pray. Father, we want to thank you this morning for life, for health, for the privilege of coming before you, dear Holy Spirit. I receive unction to minister grace to everyone that hears me this morning. Help us to comprehend what you're saying to us, that our lives will not remain the same again. In the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for my friends who have made our time to listen to me live. And those that may listen to the program, even as we store them in many devices, in the precious name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. Like I said, the topic is not one that people like to discuss. I'm yet to hear um, somebody who buys airtime, either in the television or in the radio, discussing it as a topic or someone. But we are going to discuss it because it's important to do. Running away from it will not help us. It will be like the proverbial ostrich who hides his head in the sand while the entire massive body is exposed. We will not play ostrich with this topic. By the way, the topic is preparing to die. I mean preparing to die. Die as in D-Y-D-I-E. D-I-E. Die. That's why you will understand now that it is not such a regular topic on your airwaves. But we are obliged to discuss it, preparing to die. As I received this topic, my mind ran through the many preparations I have to do, I had to do, growing up to this stage in life. And I want to single out maybe about four of them and tell you how I prepared. And the fifth one will be the one we are discussing. One of the earliest preparations I made in life was a preparation that I made in my father's house. I was just out of secondary school, sorry, out of primary school. That was in 1973. And I was to go to the secondary school. The first time I would leave my father's house to any place. My parents prepared for me. When I passed the common entrance exam, we collected the list of things to buy from the secondary school that I was to attend. We were people of small means who were never rich people. So they planned for it. They saved for it. They exhausted their servants as they were buying things. They, we couldn't buy them in block. We were buying them as money was coming. I remember occasions when I had to go with my father to the market to buy a few things because that's what the money could buy. But bet me, we finished all the buying at different times. And every time they began to prepare me for this leaving the house, they sat me down early in the morning and tell me whose son I am. They sat me down telling me that I will not disappoint. They kept preparing me, telling me a few things that I didn't even know. All in preparation to go to the school that is not far from my house. Yes, I mean not far from my house. It could walk down to the school. And going to as if, as if I'm traveling outside. They took all the time to prepare me. And eventually making me know that I'm going to meet strangers there. They need not to be influenced by negative peer group pressure and all what have you. They prepared me on appointed day. They took me to the school. We parted ways as if we are parting for good. But it was a short stay because it didn't take time. We came back on holidays. We haven't left house for the first time. There was a preparation. The second major preparation came precisely in 1980-81 when I had to go to the university and it happened that I didn't do my university in Nigeria. I did my university abroad. So they began to prepare me when it was obvious that I was going to travel. Their major concern was that they had that these people there and when the women of that place see you, they will want to take over you. And they began to devise means. My parents were not born again uh, in the sense of born again we know. And they so prepared me with what you call uh, they took me to 
one native doctor, my mom in particular, incised some things on my body, all in preparation. You can see how sincere they were, but sincerely wrong. They prepared me in every way. They need not to be taken away by the women because they hear that when you go there, they will just take you over and they for you forget your parents. They say they will even give you jars and then you will not remember your parents again. All preparations to let me go. At the end of the day, they sent me for it, prepared me for it. When it was time to come back from there, I prepared to return by myself. I didn't, I, wouldn't, I wasn't with my parents there. One of the preparations is how life would be now that I'm a graduate, master's degree holder for, for short. I needed to go do my youth service. I began to gather information on how youth service is done in Nigeria. They told me a few things I didn't know. And then I made sure I carried all my books. My books were a big container, big carton of books. In short, I had two major carry-ons. I had my bag, big bag carrying my books. It was more than the allowable uh, hand luggage, but I insisted. Somehow they pitied me and I came back carrying all those things, preparing for life after graduation as a worker, but first as a, as, as a youth copper. I continued that way. The next major preparation was when I had to go for youth co camp. I elected to go to the northern part of the country because I loved Plateau State. I loved Joss. And I asked particularly to be posted there. They prepared me because they still have control over what I do. And I prepared and I left for Joss. From Joss, I came to Lagos. That preparation wasn't made. But the next important preparation was it's time for you to marry. And you know, I see young men who come to you take, to take advice on how to get a good wife. And preparations like that will usually go with fasting and prayers. And at the, end, at the end of the day, a choice is made, a family is started. These are preparations. All these preparations cannot compare with the preparation I'm talking about, the preparation to die. Many don't prepare it. It's as if, if you talk about it, you're about to die. I can assure you I'm not about to die. No, not that I'm not going to die. I'm not preparing it because or I'm telling you to prepare because I'm about to die. No, that's not the purpose. So people should not shy away from the issue of preparation. So we will prepare to die. People don't want to hear die. And I say it's an ostrich that does that kind of thing. People detest even to hear it. I'll tell you a story. There was a man, and this is a true story, who has his room and the window outside such that people come to the window and urinate. And every now and then they come urinating. He tried to drive them out physically, but he's not always in the house to drive them. And as he continued, he devised many methods. One of the methods was to write a, a, a big signboard and say, do not urinate here by order, Nigerian police. They continued to urinate. They were not afraid of Nigerian police. Do not urinate here, please. They continued to urinate. He tried everything. Then something occurred to him. He said, okay, I'm, I know what to do. He now changed the signboard and said, Please urinate here. Your urine is needed for medicine. Sign native doctor. That was the end of that uh, urinating on his window. Why? People were scared to die. Every other effort he had made to stop them from urinating didn't work till he devised a method to tell them that they need his urine, their urine for medicine. And they, everybody ran away from the window. That's how scary that is. A young man went to buy caskets for his late father. And the person selling the caskets, he said to him, please remove some money for me. So that when you come again, I remove. He said to Fiakwa, I'm not coming. That is how dreadful. That's how people fear. They, had, they don't want to hear that they will die or that they will come near their way. Nobody wants to die, I must let you know. But it doesn't mean that nobody will die. People will still die. People are dying every day. If you know the number of people that die every day, then you must discuss it. The Bible says it is appointed to man once to die and after that the judgment. That's the Bible. I didn't write it. Appointed to man once to die and after that the judgment. It does not matter the manner of death that you will suffer. Some want to die without trouble. My mother particularly said she doesn't want to suffer anybody when she's about to die. She doesn't even want to 
to be helped in life. When life gets into dependence on people to enjoy your life, it's no longer enjoyable. She didn't want it, and it worked for her. She, she, she had an attack. In two days' time, she was gone. Nobody carried her shit. I don't know whether that one is better, but I have two to share with you again. I have a friend of mine, Tyro Smoda, strong woman, fine woman, came visiting from Bini in Lagos, visited his two sons, first to Taiwo. Keinde was a medical doctor and decided to visit Keinde alone. And then left Taiwo's house in the afternoon of that day, headed to Keinde's house. Keinde, a medical doctor, a mother, died in less than two hours in her house, in his house rather. And their doctors on duty, yes, was killing that around, yes, but dead still snatched out a beautiful woman. Didn't suffer anybody, didn't cause anybody any running around. She just died. Is that a better manner to die? I'll leave you to judge. What about somebody who suffered in sickness? My father had a stroke and lived with stroke for over two years. The advantage of this manner of death is that you, you have time to prepare. Something in you tells you that one of these days it will happen. And then you gather up yourself and prepare. You may suffer people, but it seems advantageous in the sense that you have a time to prepare. Unlike one that died by accident, life snuffed out. He didn't have time to prepare. But this lesson to learn from this is that since you don't know the day and manner, let death will come. Be ever ready that if it comes now, let it be. There are two manners of death, man, two manners of return. First is if the trumpet sounds. If the trumpet sounds, let's, let, let's read from the from First Thessalonians. If the trumpet sounds and you go, that is the end of it. If it happens that um, you die before Jesus returns, that's also the end. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14 to 18. And I want to read from here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14 to 18. And I read. Let me paraphrase it for you. That there will be a sound of an archangel and the trump of God will sound. And those of us that are alive and remain, emphasis, remain, shall catch up with the Lord in the air. But before then, those that were dead will rise up and in a column live before those of us that are alive and remain. That is death in a sense. That is transformation from life to life. It's death. That's the manner of death those people will suffer. So everyone that we are alive when Jesus returns will not die the way others die. But those that died first, in the burial ground, in the ground, those that were swallowed by animals will rise up first so long you remain in the Lord. That's one death. The other one is to die the natural way. Death had brought many fears to people. In my native country, there is a, a people that had a covenant of not to die. In my native language, they call it Ewo Ishi Eruala. Ishi Eruala means your head will not touch the ground. It simply translates to literal meaning that you will not die, you will not be led to die. In spite of the fact that they have seen people who did similar medicine and see that they eventually died, you can't believe it that people still were doing it when I was growing up in my little village. What happens is that at the point they want to die, they will suffer. If you don't help them, they will start to decay, but they are not dead. If you leave them for months, they will be snoring. Die, they won't die. Rise, they won't rise. Till somebody goes to now help them to die. Nobody had ever helped them to live. But do you know that in spite of that, people do. That is the fear that they have of death. But one beautiful thing that being born again does to a person is to stop fearing death. The Bible says, the, the, the benefit of those that give their life to Christ is that those that have been living in fear, perpetual fear of death, they are not one of them. Let me tell you, I'm not afraid of death. That's why I can discuss it. I am certain by the special grace of God that if it happens today, 
having the right relationship with God, I will make it. Not by my power. He holds me. So I, I, I'm not afraid. What makes people fear death is not knowing where they're going. I for sure know where I'm going. It's not a boast. It is an assurance of salvation that is found in the book of uh, Psalms. There is an assurance of salvation to everyone that believes. So first is, you don't have to fear death if you know your destination. The only thing I fear is what will happen to the people who depend on me daily. I have a couple of them in secondary school. I have them. I have a couple of them who depend on me. How will they survive? I know God can keep them. That's the only fear. And it's for them, not for me. Because if the trumpet sounds today, by the grace of God, I'm gone. Now, these people have fear of death. It simply means they're not preparing. The moment you give your life to Jesus, one thing that helps is that he be you begin to prepare that it could happen any day. If you go to sleep and you don't come out, so be it. If the trumpet sounds as I'm talking, so be it. Whatever manner of death that comes your way, so be it. So are you preparing? I know you are not preparing. Except if you are giving, even some who have given their life to Jesus, are surely not preparing. Because they quite don't understand what it means. This life is not in any person's hand. So nobody can kill me. So the few scriptures you have to read, they are so prepared to die. And I want to read just one of them. There's one called Samuel. And we're going to read his preparation from 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 3 to 5. And he says, Behold, I am here, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken, or whose ass have I taken, or whom have I defrauded, whom have I oppressed, or whose hand have I received any bribe to bind my eyes? Hear it, and I will restore it. And they said, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day, that ye have not found aught in my hand. And they answered, He is witness. Now let me give you the background to that story. Samuel was one of the best rulers that Israel had. In the twilight of his life, when he was packing up, he had done his work. He called a solemn assembly of Israelites. And in that assembly, he said to them, I have come to ask you to bear witness against me if in any way I have offended you, I have defrauded you, I have taken bribe from you, I have taken a thing that is yours because I'm the king. And all of them said, no, you didn't do anything to us. That's a life of one who is preparing to die. Through the light of his life, he was conscious to ask them. But adventure he had done so, so he could make amends. I do that sometimes. Look around my life and say, is there any person that I know that is not happy for what I have done to him? If I have come to know that person, I'll go to him. There's no shame about it. Did I offend you? I'm very sorry. What can I do to make amends? One who is preparing is not afraid. That was the case of Samuel. Samuel said it. I wish a Nigerian ruler could come up and say so any ruler for that matter, and say, I have come down as president. I have approached my old age. And if I have offended you, please come. I would like to make amends with you. You will see the number of people who will show up their hands that you offended them in one way or the other, rightfully or wrongly. But Samuel, the bore witness, I said, you didn't offend us. That's a man. Now, what do we do to prepare? That's the, second, the main question I would like to ask. The first thing you must do to prepare is to give your life to Jesus. That's the first thing you must do. Give your life to Jesus. When you do that, you begin to live every day for him. And he, you begin to review your life, review your life every day on the scale. Am I doing well? Am I in the right standing with God? Did I offend anybody? Did I offend God? you are in the right circle so that when it happens eventually you know the other preparations i told you the major difference between that preparation and this preparation is that that one is for a short period four months away from home and they prepared me heavily to go to the secondary school 
four years initial time they allowed me to go to study abroad even though i stayed six years because i had to add masters against their advice to come back home but it was prepared as if they would see me again but we are talking about a place when you go nobody sees you again what is that by the way what is that let's look at a few definition of death number one death is cessation of life life ceases number two death is said to be packing up of all supporting organs for the life it packs up and that's death that's why when you see somebody dying he slowly begins to pack up things that supports life this one fails that one fails that one fails and eventually life fails the next one is cessation of relationship with family members and acquaintances that is death. I will be of a stupid man if I don't know that I will die. I have seen people die. Let me tell you, the earliest time I know of death was in my kindergarten. I was in kindergarten when Jeremiah, who was my classmate, died. Kindergarten, not primary school. And we marched to their house wearing our uniform. One day we came to school. The authorities and of the school gathered the classmates to go and commiserate with the parents of this our colleague who died i won't forget the mother saw us and threw herself on the ground she first of all came to look to see whether the child was one of the people wearing uniform and when he dawned on her that she's he's not one of them wearing uniform nobody could control her cry we regretted even going because we reminded her of her son jeremiah died when i was in kindergarten have my mates died since then? Oh, my bosom friend died the other day. You know, certain day is my bosom friend or was my bosom friend. We did life together, both in Nigeria. We traveled abroad together. We studied in the same area. I used to go to his house for holidays. He used to come to my house for holidays. The family is like my family. He just dropped dead and died. I just read yesterday one friend of mine, a full gospel chapter president, young man, Sonia Naizoka. I saw it in the Facebook. He died. So I should be a stupid man if I don't know that it could happen to me. Am I special? No. I would die. So if I would die, the best thing to do is to discuss it and know how best not to be taken on our ways. And the only way not to be taken on our ways is to prepare for it. Are you preparing? I know your answer is no. But do yourself a favor. You need to prepare. No. It doesn't mean that having prepared. It's like somebody who wrote a will. I have seen somebody who wrote a will and rewrote his will and adjusted his will four or five times before he died. It doesn't mean that you are going to die. It simply means that you know that for sure, death is for the living. One day, the living will die. My parents are both dead. Their generation, my mother's elder sister, who was the last of that generation, will be buried this December. So I should be a foolish man if I don't know that it will get to my turn one day. Are you preparing to die? That question you will only answer. I'm not going to answer it for you. Remember, the way to prepare to die is to give your life to Jesus and thereafter live for him, continue to live for him. The manner of death you may not know, but as for dying, for sure, you will die. You will die. So take it from me, prepare to die. If this message touched you, if indeed you have not been prepared, if you have not given your life to Jesus, I would like to pray with you so that you prepare. There is death for the living. The daily, the living will surely die. It doesn't matter how you do it. Even if you go and do it share your life, like my people in the village, you will eventually die. So this morning, you want to give your life to Jesus, put your right hand on your chest and I would like to pray with you. Father, behold every hand that is on every chest. They have heard my testimony and my talk to them that they must prepare to die. I told them that it is appointed to man once to die and after that the judgment. There is no postponement. Let them not be taken on ways. Lord, touch every heart that had this message and wants to prepare. To prepare and live conscious knowing that it could happen any day. Thank you Lord for this today in the mighty name of Jesus. If you did that prayer with me and you have given your life to Jesus, please write us. I will be ready to read from you and respond to you. Please call us. I'll be ready to speak to you live whenever you do. We are interested in your spiritual well-being. Once more, God bless you. See you same time next Sunday for yet another message from the Stables of Brush Radio. Thank you.
mighty name of Jesus, you are blessed. Amen and amen.